My name is Raoul Eshelman. I'm a professor of Slavic literature at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. I have a long-standing interest in the visual arts, and I've followed and commented on Alina Kissina's work for a number of years now. This is a short commentary on 15 exemplary photos from Alina Kissina's photographic study, Children of Vision, which was exhibited in the Mistetsky Arsenal Museum in Kiev in 2017. For some years now, Kisina has photographed pupils and staff at the Kiev Special School of Art for Children with Impaired Vision and Other Disabilities. As the school's name suggests, its goal is not just to help disabled children, but also to promote their creativity in a wide variety of ways. Kisina's long-term association with the school has given her an insider's view into how the school works, and it helps her to capture its warm, creative, and caring atmosphere through portraits of children and staff. Kisina's approach is quite special because of the way she goes about taking the portraits. Although some of the photography is documentary in a conventional sense, many of the photos have what I would call an allegorical character. By this, I mean that Kisina makes use of colors, bold forms, and light to visually convey the presence of higher, more abstract qualities such as inquisitiveness, intensity of feeling, strength in the face of adversity, and so on. In other words, she shows that the school does not just provide a nurturing environment for the children, but as it were, forms a kind of higher uplifting unity with them. In the following commentary, I'm going to talk about certain selected pictures that I've arranged myself according to theme. My discussion doesn't follow the way the pictures were arranged in the actual exhibition. The first group of pictures I've called seeing. These pictures have visual impairment itself as their theme. Kisina, for the most part, prefers an indirect approach, which hints at the children's disabilities without focusing on them directly. In the first picture, a little boy is looking at us with a sideways glance in such a way that we quickly realize that his eyes are not entirely in sync. The way the back of his hand is placed over his mouth suggests he is frustrated by something, perhaps a difficult school problem. The diagonal lines in the photo suggest tension, and focus on a point centered near the crook of his thumb and fingers. At the same time, the warm background colors and the soft rounded form of the head and sweater suggest in visual terms that his task may not be as hard as it seems. In picture two, we see the great difficulties an albino boy has in reading even very large letters. He's bent forward in a slightly uncomfortable way and is squinting intensely at a sheet of paper. What is distinctive here is the similarity of colors in the picture. The boy himself has unusually white hair, his shirt is light pink, and the pages are white, suggesting in purely visual terms a kind of unity between him and the task before him. Picture three is one of the most striking because it confronts us directly with disability. In this case, we immediately see the blindness in one eye of the little girl who is looking at us directly and intently with her healthy eye. This image is unavoidably unsettling. However, the bright red colors of the dress, its splashy floral design and the yellow background work against this initial discomfort and instead suggest not only warmth and beauty, but also a strong personality not afraid to look back at others. The next group of pictures I've entitled Aids to Seeing. These are more directly documentary in nature, but they also use color and form very effectively to highlight certain visual therapies. In picture four, the little boy is intently reading a brightly colored book with what appears to be a large plastic magnifying device mounted over his eyes. The warm tones of the device, which match those of his skin, however soften the contrast between the boy and the visual aid, and the brightly colored images in the book suggest a lively and stimulating reading experience. Here too, the red of his lips is subtly echoed in the red colors of the book, creating an impression of harmony. In picture five, we are participants in an unknown kind of therapy. The jagged and aggressive black and white psychedelic pattern on the computer monitor contrasts in a curious way with the soft contours and color coordinated pink hues of the girl looking at the screen. The photograph's short depth of field makes the image blurry and as such visualizes visual impairment. 
What stands out, though, is the soft, rounded girl in pink and not the jagged image. In picture six, a little boy gazes inquisitively with thick blue glasses at an adult in white opening a glass medicine cabinet. The photo suggests transparency and clarity in the way children are treated. The little boy is dressed very formally in a dark blue suit, which contrasts strongly with the whiteness of the medical setting. There is a subtle congruence between the diagonal lines of the stenciled red letters and the boy's blue glasses, and the cat poster on the wall suggests that the otherwise sterile medical environment is marked by humor. The next set of pictures has to do with the school environment and how children are framed and supported by it. In picture seven, we see a small boy with thick glasses who has slid halfway underneath his desk, probably to look for a book or paper in the desk's lower shelf. Here, the dynamic bright green curved tubes of the desk seem to echo the curvature of his body and create a visual allegory of flexibility and strength in difficult circumstances. The green tubes of the chair give solid support to his back. The strikingly allegorical picture eight visualizes sound as well as the intensity of the little boy's listening experience. The frizzy-haired boy appears to hear in stereo the two records on the wall behind him. The brown tones of the boy's skin and sweater contrast with the cool green, blue-green background of the wall and suggest the warmth of his inner listening experience. The little girl in picture nine seems a bit apprehensive as she stands in the bright tubular frame of a playground slide, but the white and blue of her blouse and plaid dress create a strong unity with the colors of the slide. The metal frame seems to enhance the strength of her personality, which is marked as distinctive by the bright red corrective glasses. The next set of pictures emphasize the way children interact with each other. Picture 10 was evidently taken in the same room as picture eight, but works in a different way. The two peacefully sleeping girls, perhaps even twins, merge into what is almost a single black and white form. Their peaceful unity is neatly framed and echoed by the black and white records on the blue-green wall behind them. In picture 11, we can't see the faces of these children climbing up a practice wall, but the photo neatly captures the essence of what the wall is there for. The bright yellow guardrail on top marks an open horizon and a goal to be achieved. The mottled dark and light blue color of the wall suggests dynamic activity, and the different positions of the children depict different stages in overcoming the obstacles the wall poses. One child has almost reached the top, the next is searching for a secure foothold, and the little girl seems to be either getting down or revising her old position. In picture 12, we are struck by the dynamic way with which the joyous and confident little girl leads the little boy, who seems to have lost his orientation and is almost staggering blindly into our arms. The picture shows in a very vivid way how even a simple activity like running is difficult for the visually impaired children, and it shows how fearlessly they plunge into it nonetheless. The last set of pictures is entitled States of Mind. It contains photos that capture pupils in different emotional and mental states. Picture 13 is a very humorous but also very telling photo. The blonde little girl with the enormous black glasses and black jacket seems to be stalking an eraser as if it were an insect crawling across the desk. However, the little girl's strabismus, which means eyes pointing in different directions, makes this task more difficult than it seems. The photo suggests that in this school, children have time and opportunity to create small worlds of their own where they can come to terms with visual impairments creatively. Picture 14 shows two girls in what seems to be an almost beatific state of listening or dancing to music. The flatness of the depth of field and the white and gray tones make them indeed appear almost angelic. The intensity of the experience is magnified by the clearly focused girl in the foreground being doubled by the unfocused girl in the background. Through the sum of its parts, 
Picture 15, I think, says a great deal about the school as a whole. The girl is framed by the strong, colorful lines and bright colors of the playground structure, and she is calmly reaching out with closed eyes and an extended arm. This suggests that the school is not just teaching her or providing therapy, but also encouraging her to try to gain independence on her own.